The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's one of those drowsy summer afternoons, the sort of day executives spend on their favorite golf course, and office workers spend watching the clock. But not Mike Shane. He's hard at work. Hudged over a desk in his private office, Mike's mind is clicking like a Powell Street cable car. In fact, he's right in the middle of a crossword puzzle. Phyllis Knight, his capable assistant, is daydreaming in the outer office, gazing out a window at San Francisco's rooftops. A quiet day? Let's be frank. It's a downright dull afternoon. But wait. Is this Michael Shane's office? Uh, uh, yes. Do you wish to see him? Idiotic question. Of course I wish to see him. In there, I suppose. Wait. Well, of all the nerve. Are you Michael Shane? Hmm? Oh, yes. And the young lady who was suffering from spring fever is my usually capable assistant, Miss Phyllis Knight. Won't you have a chair? I'm Winifred Spencer. The society columnist? I believe that is the correct title although most of my readers and radio listeners prefer to call me a gossip writer. I know something of your work as a detective, Mr. Shane. Well, I'm just an amateur, Miss Spencer, in comparison with you when I think of all the skeletons you've dug out of closets. I'm afraid I've found one too many, Mr. Shane. Hmm? I received this letter this morning. I'm going to kill you. Your poison words have caused grief, wrecked fortunes, divorce, suicides. Now they're going to cause your death. There are scores who would like to kill you. None has a better reason than I, so I'm going to kill you. What would you do if you received such a letter? I'd read it the second time on a train, a fast train. No, Mr. Shane. You'd go after the writer, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. You think you know the person? I hope I uh, to know tonight. Mr. Shane, will you and Miss... Uh, Miss Knight? Will you and Miss Knight be at my home at 8 o'clock? Hmm? I'm having a dinner party, and I believe you will find the guests interesting. You may even find the person so intent on murdering me. We'll be there, Miss Spencer. Oh, may I keep this note and the envelope too, please? Of course. And please dress. You're to be friends from out of town tonight. We'll endeavor to be presentable. And I trust prompt. Goodbye, Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. Goodbye. Mike, hmm? you didn't ask her any questions. Well, for the present, Angel, I'd rather she did the talking. Hmm. Now, I believe she was actually frightened. Oh, she'd scared stiff, honey. Her chickens are coming home to roost. Half the people in San Francisco, the so-called better half, would like nothing better than to send flowers to her funeral. Yeah, I guess that's true enough. Now, you can't grow up on the right side of the tracks, tattle on your friends, and not get your fingers burned. Hey, isn't there a brother somewhere in the background? Mm-hmm. Mm, a bit younger than the old Dane. Went through his money fast, and now they say he's going through hers. I believe he lives with her. Oh. Let's have a look at the note, huh? Envelope plain, business type. Dressed to the old girl at her office. Mailed at 6 p.m. last night. You uh, noticed anything odd about the paper? Oh, let me look at it against the light. Watermark business stationery, Mike. This has been torn. The letterhead's been torn off. Right you are, Angel. Now, look at the typing. Yeah, it looks almost like a professional job to me. Could be... Well, come on, let's do a bit of research on San Francisco's society. Oh, that won't be necessary, Mike. I'm one of Winifred's uh, constant readers. Just ask me questions. I'll remember that when the time comes. Uh, now, please, Mr. Shane, I'd like the rest of the afternoon off. We get a red-hot client and you want to play. No, dear, I want to get my hair done. We're stepping out in society tonight. Say, I wonder if I've got a black tie. <laughs> It's an old mansion. Look at the Iron Deer on the lawn, Mike, and mm. the bay window in front. Not as big as the Palace Hotel, but older. Anybody with Iron Deer on the lawn is just inviting murder. Yeah. 
Ooh, it gives me the creeps. Ivy all over the walls. Probably some growing inside, too. Yeah. Anyhow, let's find out. Ring the bell. Uh, you mean lift the knocker. Oh. This way, please. Bring them in here, Henry. This way, please. Oh, I'm glad you came early. Nice to be here, Miss Spencer. What an unusual house. Oh, yes, this old house is filled with memories. The Spencers have lived here since 1850. Say, that's a fine old square rigger model on the mantelpiece there. My grandfather sailed the original round the horn. He brought uh, most of the furniture you see here with him. Oh. This desk was one of his prized possessions. Well, it looks like it's being put to use these days, too. Typewriter, lots of books. Is uh, this your study? No, I do my work at the office. My brother, Seward, spends quite a bit of time in here. Seward likes to think of himself as a writer. Is your brother here tonight, Miss Spencer? Yes, with his latest conquest, a Miss Melody. You'll meet them at dinner. Oh. Uh, we'd better be getting back to the dining room. It's time for the guests. Uh... I think there's somebody behind that curtain. Huh? Of course there is. The curtains hide a service entrance. Come in, Henry. Pardon me, Miss Spencer. Oh. May I announce dinner? Yes, Henry. We're ready. Will you please stop boring one another and listen? I have a surprise for you. This is my broadcast night, and it's almost time for me to go on the air. You're going to do your broadcast right here? No, I recorded it this afternoon. But we're going to listen to it on the radio. I thought it would be interesting to have the people I'm going to talk about as my guests. That's why most of you are here tonight. I'm sure you'll find what I have to say uh, interesting. Uh, Mr. Davis, Hugh, please step into the drawing room and turn on the radio. I don't want anyone to miss a word of this broadcast. Oh, you might have spared us this, Winifred. I'm through protecting you, Seward. Well, I'm not going to sit here and be made a fool of by my own sister. You'll remain right where you are. What's the station, Winifred? And for heaven's sakes, how do you turn this antique on? Oh, bother, I'll come and do it. I believe he was afraid to turn it on. What's this all about, Mike? It looks like she's going to tittle-tattle on Seward and her guests. Oh. Hey, Mike, look at Seward. He's ready to explode. He's not by himself, honey. Most of the guests seem to have high blood pressure. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. There's Mr. Davis. He's standing there by the door laughing. Huh? <laughs> oh, it looks like the joke's on Winifred. I don't believe the radio's going to work. Well, what seems to be wrong with the radio? Well, that's what Winifred's trying to find out. She should have bought a new one years ago. Are you sure it's plugged in, Winifred? Well, I guess we're going to have to listen to her. And now, your society reporter, Winifred Spencer. Good evening. This is Winifred. Have I been gathering tidbits about people you know? The first item tonight concerns an immediate member of your reporter's family, my brother Seward. He has played with fire once too often, and I regret to announce that I my brother stay and has listen. gone too Come on, Merle. She's got no right to talk to you. There goes Seward into the drawing room, and Miss Melody right after him. Oh, come on, Bill. Let's get in there. Hey, hey, what goes on here? It's Winifred. She's dead. She's dead. Hmm. A knife in her back? She's dead, all right. <laughs> The inspector is on his way. Mike has announced his identity and taken over. Ten minutes has elapsed since someone murdered Winifred Spencer in her drawing room, not more than 12 steps from where a dozen guests sat finishing their dinner. May I have your attention, please? Now, I'm sure that you want to return to your homes, and there's no reason why those of you who were at the table when Miss Spencer met her death should remain. Oh. You may leave now before the police arrive, if you wish. Hey, the inspector isn't going to like this, Mike. Hmm? You said yourself that there were ten people here who had reason to murder Miss Spencer. I said there were at least ten people who would love to murder her. Hmm. Whoever killed the old dame had a lot stronger motive than revenge, Angel. I let them go because they were cluttering up the place. Now, just the same. The inspector isn't going to like it. Watch this. I'm not going to like it. No. Huh? 
Mike got big hearted and let some of the guests go home. Uh, we can always bring her back, Phil. Who's left? That's Miss Spencer in the chair with a knife in her back, Inspector. Oh. I believe I told you on the phone that her brother Seward took a powder. Yeah. The lady on the sofa is his. Uh... I am uh, Merle Melody, and I'm sticking around a little. Seward will be back. He just lost his temper and couldn't face the guests. Lost his temper, huh? Oh, tut, tut. And uh, the gray-haired gentleman who looks like a banker is a banker. Family friend named Hugh Davis. He's coming over to say hello. Glad you're here, Inspector. I'm Hugh Davis. Mr. Shane has told yeah, you that's the that's why I'm here. I understand you're an old friend. I suppose I know Winifred as well as anyone in San Francisco. I've been the Spencer's banker for 20 years, Inspector. Hmm? Did uh, you handle Seward's financial affairs too, Mr. Davis? Yes, although I must say they became rather tangled. Miss Spencer mentioned something about his spending a great deal of money on his new girlfriend. The charming Miss Melody. None of us approved of that infatuation. All this might never have happened. Well, you'd better tell us all about it, Mr. Davis. I'd much rather discuss the matter when Seward is present. Mr. Spencer isn't here. He's flown the coop, so let's have it now. What about Seward and his money? It wasn't his money. Oh, Winifred was generous with him, generous to a fault, in my opinion. Seward spent the last of his fortune more than a year ago. So he has uh, been living off his sister, eh? Yes, Mr. Shane. Well, it's not a very pretty picture, but you can't hang a man for sponging. Something I'd like to know, Mike. Yeah, what, Angel? Well, I'd like to know what Winifred Spencer said about Seward in her broadcast tonight. It ended rather suddenly here. You know? I picked up the script on the way over, Phil. Just a lot of society gab and a sprinkling of sneers. Right people in the wrong places. Uh-huh. What'd she say about her brother and his girlfriend? Well, let's see. Oh, yes, yeah, she said Seward had stepped out of bounds with a chorus girl. They were dropping his name from the social register. Then she said she doubted that Miss Melody would be able to support Seward in the style he'd been accustomed to. Oh, so a sister was going to cut him off. That right, Mr. Davis? Yes, they had a bitter quarrel a couple of days ago. Will Seward inherit Miss Spencer's money, Mr. Davis? I think the proper person to advise you on that matter is Miss Spencer's attorney. Mm. Maybe you're right, Davis, but as uh, Miss Spencer's banker, I believe you can answer the question. Well, I'd much prefer that Seward was present, but... Well, I don't suppose this is any time to be guarding family secrets. You're right so far. Now, look, if you know anything, spill it. I doubt that there will be more than several hundred dollars in this old house for Seward to inherit. What? Well, what happened to the old lady's fortune? Well, I'd much rather wait... Well, it'll have to come out sooner or later. Winifred and Seward have had the same safety deposit box at the bank for years. Just three days ago, Winifred came to my office highly agitated. More than $200,000 in negotiable bonds were missing from the box. And just what has your bank done about finding the two hundred grand in bonds? Mr. Shane, there are times when a bank has to use discretion. We hope to recover Miss Spencer's property without undue publicity or scandal. That's one reason I sent Winifred to you this afternoon. So, Brother Seward raided the box. That is all too evident, There's Miss another Knight. thing quite evident, sir. If you and Miss Spencer hadn't been so cagey, ducking the very thing that little Winifred dished out, scandal, she might be alive right now. We thought we were doing the right thing. Well, that's water under the bridge. Mike. Hmm? Do you notice anything missing from the room? Well, sure, Angel, the body. The police doctor just left a few minutes uh -huh. ago. No, not that body. Merle. Merle Melody. Huh? Holy smoke, she has gone. You better search, Mike, with the murderer still on the loose. There's only one way she could have gone, through here. The door's open. Try that room, Inspector. I'll try this one. Right. Here she is, on a bed. Is she alive? Well, I don't know yet. Yeah. Yeah, she's breathing. Hmm. Now it's like a light. Oh, oh sleeping pills. Yeah, I guess so. Pulse is slow, but regular. Didn't want to answer questions, eh? All right, let us sleep. Let's have a look around while we're back here, Mike. You read my mind, Inspector. Uh, which way is the kitchen, Davis? Next turn to the left and down the hall. Here it is. Hmm, it's as big as a barn. And just as empty. The sergeant came back here when he searched the house. He probably sent the servants All to right, their quarters. What's that? What have you picked up, Sergeant. I just nabbed the butler. Let me go in the back door. Bring him into the light. Wow. Look who's with him. The missing brother. Thanks, Sarge. I'll take him. All right, sir. Bring him into the drawing room, Inspector. Here we are. All right, talk. Where have you been all evening, Mr. Spencer? What are police doing all around the house? Where? Where's Winifred? What have you done with Miss Melody? I'll have the answer to my question first, Mr. Spencer. Where have you been? I've walked for miles. I don't know where I've been. 
You were here when I lost my temper and dashed out, Mr. Shane. Winifred had no right to humiliate me before my friends. I hated to come back here. Then why did you come back? I don't know. This is my home. Where is Winifred, Merle? Miss Melody's asleep, Mr. Spencer. Your sister is dead. What? Murdered. No. No, that isn't true. I saw her sitting in that chair when I ran out the front door. Yes, Spencer, she was there. It also looks as if you stopped long enough to stick a knife into her back. No. No, I didn't do it. I might have wanted to, but I didn't. Just a minute, Henry. Where are you going? To my quarters, sir. You'd better stick around. Say, where were you when Miss Spencer's broadcast began? Uh, oh, yes, yes, I recall. I, I was preparing to serve the coffee, sir. I saw you going toward the side entrance to the drawing room when Miss Spencer left the table to turn on the radio. Oh. So you entered the drawing room by the side door, just ahead of Miss Spencer? I did not, sir. The door was closed. I I stood outside listening. I, I never miss one of Miss Spencer's broadcasts. Why did you lie to me about serving the coffee? I was frightened. You don't look like the type that frightens easily. Were you outside with Mr. Spencer? No, I heard someone at the back. It was Mr. Spencer. I let him in. Didn't the sergeant tell you to stay in your room? I have always answered the door, sir. That's probably the only truthful answer you've given me. Inspector. Yeah? Want to help me with an experiment? What are you going to do, Mike? I'd like to refresh my memory, Inspector. Let's all go into the dining room. Now, there's one thing I want to find out. All right, everybody, please take the places you had when Miss Spencer turned on the radio. I see. Mr. Davis, when I give the word, you are to get up and walk to the radio in the drawing room. Yes. Wait a few seconds and call just as you did at dinner. Very well. Phil, Phil, you be Miss Spencer and answer him. All right, Mike. Henry? Henry, you had better take your eavesdropping post by the side door, if that's where you really were. Yes, sir. Mr. Spencer, when Mr. Davis returns to the dining room, I want you to run into the drawing room. Oh, do I have to go through with this again? Yes, you have to go through with it again. No, I can't. I... I can't... Oh. What? Seward. Seward has fainted. Was that what you wanted to find out, Mike? No. No, that wasn't on the schedule, Angel. <laughs> A couple of minutes has passed. Seward has been placed on a leather couch. Mike, Phil, and the others are gathered around the couch. A rather cruel thing to do, Mr. Shane, pretending to make Seward go through with all that nonsense. It wasn't nonsense, Mr. Davis. Here, loosen his collar. Henry, is there any brandy in here? I'll fetch it, Mr. Davis. It's in the pantry. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's coming, too. No, I can't. I can't. Huh? Oh, I fainted. Yes, yes, you fainted. All right, now... Now, maybe you'll tell us why you killed your sister. What you did with those bonds. I didn't kill Winifred. I tell you, I didn't. And I don't own any bonds. Uh, my glasses. I've lost my glasses. Uh, Mr. Right. Shane, hmm? you've tried your methods. May I try mine? What are your methods, Mr. Davis? I'd like to talk with Seward for a few minutes, alone. I've known him since he was a boy. That's up to the inspector. Why not let him talk, Mike? My man have the place corked up like a bottle. Well, okay, but remember... We'll be just outside the door. Oh, I don't like this, Inspector. But, Mike, all we got on Spencer is circumstantial evidence. The fact he was the last one with his sister. Don't forget the $200,000 in bonds. I'm not, Phil, but with this kind of evidence, I need a confession. We'll get it, Inspector, from one of the three. Three? Yeah, sure. Seward, the butler, and Davis. Davis has a pretty fair alibi, Mike. You told me yourself he was back at the table seated before Winifred Spencer turned on the radio. Yeah, that's right, Mike. He was sitting on my left. Yes, yes. He was in the dining room, but he's still on my list. Now, mm. let me see. I know it. What are you muttering about, Mike? Ten steps, twelve, maybe fourteen seconds. That's it. That's it. Why didn't I think of it before? Come on, let's go. It's in the bag, Inspector. Maybe you got it locked up, Mike, but I... Oh, there you are, Inspector. It didn't take long. Well, Davis, the conference over. What's that you've got in your hand, Mr. Spencer? Well, you thought I should sign it. The bonds... Uh... I'll explain. Seward wanted to make a statement after we'd talked a bit. All right, what about? Seward and I talked things over, and I typed a statement which he dictated to me. Yes, I wanted to clear up any... Let me see that paper. Did you read this before you signed it, Mr. Spencer? Well, I, I can't read without my glasses. Hugh read it to me. I though. thought so. 
Mr. Spencer, this is a signed confession to the murder of your sister. So what? you did get it, Davis. He tricked me. He told me to say Winifred took the bond. I didn't kill her. Grab him, Inspector. No, no, not sure. You gave him. What's the matter with no. you? Hold him. Let me let me search him, Inspector. Why, you... Well, here's a pair of glasses. This is outrageous. Those are my glasses. Like to try them on for size? You couldn't get them on with a pair of pliers. They're Seward's glasses. You picked them up when you helped carry them in here. You're crazy. Davis? Davis, you killed Winifred Spencer when you found out you couldn't hoodwink her any longer about the theft of those bonds, the bonds you stole. Are you out of your mind, Shane? I was standing where you could touch me when Winifred was killed. You killed Miss Spencer. You tried to hang the murder and the theft of 200000 in bonds on young Spencer. You stole his glasses, persuaded him to sign a confession he couldn't even read. You'll find such absurd surmises difficult to prove, Mr. Shane. I couldn't have killed Winifred, and all of you know it. Mike, I, I really don't see how it was possible. I was with you in the dining room when Winifred was killed. I was standing within plain sight of at least a dozen people. Can you answer that one, Mike? I don't have to, Inspector. It has nothing to do with the killing. Now, I think you're all familiar enough with the radio set to know that after you switch it on, it takes a few seconds to warm up. A few seconds, yes. But I was in the dining room considerably more than a few seconds, Mr. Shane. Besides which, I was carrying on a conversation with Winifred, in full view of you all. A one-sided conversation. Winifred didn't answer. Very convenient of you to think of that now, Mr. Shane. But hardly enough to charge me with murder. I'm afraid Mr. Davis has a point there, Mike. Mr. Davis has a point in that I was half asleep when I should have been wide awake. I heard the noise that was the clue as to who killed Winifred Spencer. All of you who were in the dining room heard it, too. But no one thought anything about it. You... you mean the snap of the radio switch? Well, I heard Miss Spencer turn it on, too. But that's just where we were all wrong, Angel. We what? didn't hear the radio switch when Miss Spencer turned it on. Mr. Davis? Yes? This is what you did. You saw that the radio was plugged into a light switch. So you switched off the light. That meant that when Miss Spencer switched on the radio, nothing happened. You grabbed her, slapped your hand over her mouth, and stabbed her. Then you walked to the dining room door, stood there talking... And when sufficient time had elapsed, sufficient time that you felt you had an alibi, you slipped your arm behind the wall, pulled on the light switch, and about 10 to 15 seconds later, the radio came on. Anything to say to that, Mr. Davis? From the look on his face, you must have been right, Mike. Oh, I know I'm right. His efforts at blaming young Spencer will hold up in any court. Okay, here's yours, Inspector. <laughs> Kidnapped. <laughs> this isn't the way home. I've got to get that society clam bake off my conscience, honey. We're heading for Fisherman's Wharf. Oh. Maybe a nice cold lobster. Mm. Jeepers. We forgot all about Merle Melody. Oh, the Sleeping Beauty? <laughs> well, she's young Spencer's problem now. Mike, hmm? what made you so sure Davis was the murderer? Oh, he kept tipping his hand. Yeah, but that radio business was a clever alibi. Mm. Not too clever, Inspector. He counted on the noise covering up the click of the switch. His timing was bad. It didn't. Yeah. We both heard the snap, but we weren't thinking fast. Well, maybe you can tell me one other thing, Mike. I'll make a stab at it, Angel. Oh, don't use that word. Hmm? I only wanted to know if they serve Crab Louie where we're going. When you look like that, Angel, they'll serve you anything. Oh, <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Tom Petty and based on a character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company.
This is Michael Shane with a message from Director of Fleet Maintenance, Admiral V.D. Chaplin, United States Navy. It reads, quote, To all welders, riggers, electricians, coppersmiths, and other skilled shipyard repairmen. Subject, Fleet Maintenance. There is a serious skilled labor shortage in all West Coast shipyards due to heavy battle damage suffered by our warships in recent weeks. For three straight months, NIP planes have hampered, hammered at our fleet off Okinawa. One day alone, late, late in May, 11 of our ships were hit. Not every day is that bad, but every day is bad enough. Until these smashed ships can be patched up or rebuilt, they are as total a loss to the fleet as if they were sunk. This is an urgent appeal to all skilled workers who may be able to qualify as shipyard repairmen to apply at once to the nearest United States Employment Service office, unquote. Well, that pretty well tells it, friends, except to say that if you can qualify as a shipyard repair worker, apply at once. You'll find the number of the nearest United States Employment Office in your phone book. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.